Okay, day 14, section three. Um, we're once again talking about the goals of monetary policy and the two main goals that the, the Fed has for monetary policy is high output, low inflation. That said, there are some other goals that the Fed also has. We, we could kind of call these secondary goals, but at times they also become very important for the Fed. Right, they also become very important for the Fed. So let's kind of talk about some of these secondary goals that the Fed has. Right, the first is high employment, and really, this one is closely related to their goal of high output. Right, because to get high employment, you also have to have high output, and vice versa. Um, it's really the flip side of the argument. In fact, if you look here in the US, this is looking at the relationship between unemployment and output gap. And notice that when output is below potential output, unemployment is high. And when output is below, I'm sorry, when output is above potential output, unemployment is relatively low. So this relationship between employment and output is really the two sides of the, the same coin. So in fact, the Fed has to maintain high employment. Well, the Fed, well, the Fed, um, the Fed really doesn't make a big distinction between high employment and high output, right? Um, and so the Fed is committed by the Employment Act of 1946 to maintaining high employment and price stability. And that's the trade-off, right? The trade-off. Um, sometimes the Fed refers to this as the dual mandate, right? The dual mandate, maintaining high employment and price stability. Of course, you know, this dual mandate, you notice is a little, it's a little inexact, right? What, what does high employment mean? Um, the Fed is not committed to right, maintaining unemployment at 3% or maintaining inflation at 2%. The, the Fed has no explicit goal set to them by the government. They're just supposed to maintain high employment and price stability, right? And they can kind of define that as they like. And so the Fed has a lot of flexibility here in terms of how they actually um, choose these goals. The Fed also has as, a, as a, res, a secondary responsibility, the stability of financial markets, right? The Fed wants to keep financial markets stable, in part because this feeds their two big goals of inflation and output. Um, so the Fed wants to keep interest rates stable and asset prices stable and the banking system stable. The problem is we also have a free market, right? In a free market, prices are gonna have to move. The, the Fed can't be involved in every single little up and down in the stock market, right? Nor should they be. Um, and so this is a balance the Fed has to think about. When are things be so bad that, they, that the Fed is, needs to promote stability in financial markets and not in, in order to promote stability in output? And so what the, the Fed really focuses on is emergencies, right? The Fed tries to ignore financial markets generally, but when they feel like there is a big emergency, they can become very focused on the stability of financial markets. Um, during the 2008, that became very clear. And right now, the Fed is very focused on financial markets because they're worried that what's happening with the pandemic could impact financial markets, and then financial markets could then impact the economy, right? So in other words, while the, the economy is being directly hurt by the pandemic, it could also be indirectly hurt by the pandemic because by, by ruining financial markets. The Fed also, in times in its history, has been interested in exchange rates, right? Maybe making sure that the dollar, the value of the dollar is stable. Why? Because a stable dollar helps promote international trade and it helps um, stabilize foreign capital flows. However, in practice, the Fed doesn't really think about this very much. And there's a couple of reasons. First, we are a very big country and we are not nearly as dependent on international trade and foreign capital as many other countries. And so the Fed doesn't have to do this, right? The trade is a relatively small part of our economy. But the bigger reason why the Fed doesn't have to worry about stabilizing um, the dollar is because the dollar is special. It is an international currency. As we're gonna talk about more in the days going forward,
what this means is that everybody has to stabilize to the dollar, but we don't have to worry about stabilizing to them, right? That we, because we have a, a special role here, every country is worried about their exchange rate relative to the dollar, and we don't really have to worry so much about what happens to it. Um, so I'll, I'll explain that more going forward, but you know, this, is, this is one reason why many countries kind of result, re resent the United States is because while the dollar is an international currency, the Fed doesn't spend much time thinking about what's happening to the dollar relative to other countries, right? The Fed sp spends a lot of time about thinking about the U.S., right? In, in many, so in other ways, to put this in another way, many countries complain that the Fed has always been America first and doesn't think nearly enough about how their actions impact other economies. No matter what the goal of the Fed is, right? Many times these goals reinforce each other, right? So financial stability could be an, an important part of output stability. And output stability could be an important part of maintaining high employment. But at other times, they can be in direct conflict, right? Um, there's times when stabilizing the dollar is in conflict with stabilizing employment. Or inflation is often in conflict with maintaining high employment. So, you know, we have a situation here where the Fed really is trying to, to balance many different objectives. And as we're going to talk about here in a minute, that is one critique of how the Fed operates, is that the Fed is trying to do too many things at once, and that greatly increases the chance of it making a mistake, and also maybe means that the Fed doesn't do any one of these things particularly well. Right? But we'll, we'll come back and talk about that criticism here in a minute. Let me talk very briefly about not the goals of monetary policy, but the targets of monetary policy. The Fed, as we've talked about, focuses on targeting interest rates. But should the Fed, right? Or, or what other things could the Fed do? Could the Fed target the money supply instead? Or could the Fed target stock prices or bank lending or some other target other than the federal funds rate? Um, and the answer is yes, I, absolutely. The Fed could pick some other target to focus on on a day-to-day -day basis. So how, does, how did the Fed choose the federal funds rate as their kind of main target? And, and why does the Fed spend so much time thinking about interest rates? Well, economic theory tells us that what's, what makes for a good target, right? What makes for a good target? And once again, if you want to apply the, um, the golf analogy here, you can think about what makes for a good target in golf. What's, what makes for a good target that you can shoot for? And a good target should be measurable, meaning can you actually observe it? Do you know where it is? Can, can you actually say something about it, right? This actually is a problem with money supply data, is that we really only observe the money supply data with a lag because we need that information from banks and banks don't give it in real time. So that's, that's a problem with the money supply. This is a big argument for using a market-based target like an interest rate or a stock price because we can measure that because stock markets or, or, or financial markets give us real-time information. Two, any target should be controllable. In other words, it's something that we actually can achieve, right? It's something that we directly control. So does the Fed directly control the money supply? No, for reasons that we've talked about the, yesterday, the Fed doesn't control the money multiplier. And so the Fed has relatively loose control over money supply, particularly in the short run. The Fed used to control the money supply or used to target the money supply, sorry, but they gave up because it became increasingly difficult for the Fed to control the money supply on a day-to-day -day basis. One um, member of the Federal Reserve said, we didn't leave targeting the money supply, it left us. Meaning it has become harder and harder for the Fed to target the money supply on this day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I think that, that makes the money supply not such a great target. Um, and then I think the same would be true of a stock price, right? To what extent does the Fed really control stock prices or bank lending? 
Not very well, not very well. But the Fed does have more control over the federal funds rate, right? Particularly because as we talked about yesterday, they've developed all these operating procedures that really give them very, very tight control over it. And then finally, predictability. How volatile is it? Is it all over the place? That makes the stock, stock prices a very bad target because stock prices are all over the place on a daily day-to-day -day basis. Same with the money supply. But the federal funds rate, less so, right? Interest rates, less so. And so, you know, I, I think really the Fed focuses on the federal funds rates because of all the things that they could use as a target, it's the most measurable, it's the most controllable, and it is the most predictable, right? So, anyway, um, that was a very short little session. <laughs> we will come back for one more relatively short session, and I want to talk about the Taylor rule, meaning if, if the Fed's going to pick an interest rate target, how do they pick exactly what interest rate target, right? And so we'll, we'll talk about that.